about the, the, the rebels who were involved in the rising. It talked about Ian Paisley. It, talk, it had the Queen as part of it. I believe uh, David Cameron and Bono. So, you know, that was then. This is now. There's absolutely no connection. And our hands are free from anything to do with insurrection, rebellion, and, and, and talk of revolution and uprisings against imperialism. And really, this is at the heart of the contradiction, I think, for the Irish establishment, that this event was crucial in establishing um, a different Ireland, uh, and they have, uh, they, you know, their whole uh, world outlook uh, has nothing to do with the aspirations and the goals uh, of that. And I'm sure people have seen um, that in recent years, the, uh, you know, there's been, since the economic crisis, the Irish establishment have found themselves on the wrong side of the main questions uh, animating Irish society. From the water charges movement um, to the recent elections where the establishment parties who have long dominated Irish politics from the, from the Civil War on um, have seen their support plummet. So one, one statistic is really telling in terms of what's actually happening in Ireland right now, uh, which is the kind of fragmentation of, of politics. In 1983, uh, the establishment parties garnered 97% of the vote. That was Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil, and the Labour Party, the party that Connolly uh, founded in 1912. Uh, and this year, in this election, they, they, they between them had 56% of the vote. Um, and the Labour Party itself went from 37 seats in 2011 to, to hanging on to getting speaker's rights in the doll this time round with seven seats. Um, so there's a there's something changing in Ireland, um, and I you know and I think that there's going to be a much larger political opposition in, in the new Doyle, whatever it actually comes to look like. So this is um, this is the context that the celebrations and the commemorations are going to happen uh, over the next couple of months in Ireland. So uh, on the one hand, the establishment is trying to figure out how to ride this through without endorsing 1916, without encouraging people in the rebellion by saying <laughs> these are people you should uh, model yourselves on or um, uh, learn from. Uh, and when that doesn't work, there's the, the, an attempt to try and dismiss the rising uh, as John Bruton did by saying that the 1916, uh, the, the violence of 1916 has had a long-term uh, impact uh, on the psychology of Irish people, meaning it damaged them psychologically, uh, and that's this is their way of uh, you know dismissing the rising and the people who participated in it. Um, but when you think about what they're trying to do again there, which is uh, uh, you know you think about the, the the period that they were in and who was actually responsible for introducing violence in the in the in the Irish society. It certainly was in the rebels in 1816. Uh, you know, Ireland at the time. Ireland at the time, obviously, was a colony held by Brit mil British military force. That's number one. Number two, uh, the UVF, the Ulster Volunteers, had just armed themselves with guns from Germany, promising the uh, armed rebellion against the British government in Ireland if home rule became a reality. Uh, and I think that they were very intent on doing that. Um, uh, thirdly. Uh, John Redman, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, had went up and down Ireland along with his British counterparts, encouraging Protestant and Catholic uh, workers to join the British military effort in uh, on the continent. That led to 200,000 Irish people joining the British army, with 50,000 of them being murdered uh, in in Europe. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, in the context of the Great War, the, a war that killed 17 million people, right, uh, and and they destroyed much of Europe. Uh, that's what brought violence into Ireland, and 1916 was a response to that, uh, to all of those um, forms of violence. And I think that that's the beginning of the discussion for us in terms of why we should celebrate 1916, that it was a response to imperialism, that it was a response to barbarism, and that it was a response to, to, to the slaughter that was raging across uh, Europe, and that had a direct impact inside Ireland as well. And that there were great aspirations in 1916 uh, that went unfulfilled, and I think we can talk about why they didn't go unfulfilled, but I think that's important in terms of challenging uh, uh, you know, the some of the establishment arguments. There's a third thing that I think is important in terms of uh, the context, which is right now there's a lot of focus on the details of the rising in Ireland itself, meaning what happened in Easter week, 
uh, where, were, where the battles happened, what happened inside the GPO, um, who was involved, what exactly did they do, what, what are the different gun battles look like. And I think all these things are very, very important. Um, and there's things involved in that in the British Army shooting down civilians as if they were combatants, which is important for people to kind of know about. Um, but again, and when there's such an intense focus on the details of, of Easter week, it actually doesn't allow us to have a discussion about the ideas that inspired and animated the rebels and all the other participants that were part of, uh, part of the rebellion. And what does that do? Um, there's a number of myths uh, about, about 1916. Um, and I'll just throw them out uh, and maybe uh, I'll try and address some of them but they can be part of the discussion as well. But the, this idea that like, uh, you know, a minority of people, uh, or the idea that a minority of people liberated Ireland, which simply isn't true. Um, the rebels themselves, there were 16 people executed, but there was many thousands of people uh, involved in the actual uprising. Uh, but if you actually step back and look at the, the year of the decade of revolution that happened in Ireland from 1913 to 1923, uh, it's not about a minority, it's about how hundreds of thousands of Irish people, <coughs> men and women, uh, attempted to liberate Ireland and create a completely different country. So the focus in on the minority of activists, I think, uh, allows a certain myth uh, that has been utilised by different political uh, traditions to kind of survive. So one thing, uh, People don't necessarily know a lot about Connolly's role in 1916 in terms of why he ended up there uh, or what his ideas were, but there's also a huge gap in terms of um, the, the uh, period after 1916 and what it opened up, meaning that there was a social revolution in Ireland after 1916, that 1916 played a role in, in detonating um, but, uh, but, but, uh, and, and was crucial in doing that. But the lockout itself in 1913 that Connolly was an organiser of, Connolly seen that not as a simple labour battle, he called it, this is, this is a class war that is going to shape uh, the future of Ireland, meaning if home rule actually comes into Ireland, uh, the, the, the battle is happening right now over who's going to govern it, who's going to govern the new Ireland. Is it going to be uh, you know, nationalist employers along with orange employers, or is it going to be the labour movement, is it going to be the working class? That's how Connolly talked about 1913, the 1913 lockout at the time. Um, and then you, you look at the period from 1917 on, there were, in addition to the kind of uh, military war of liberation, which was very successful and effective at uh, denying uh, you know, the, uh, the British military and the Irish police uh, the, uh, the uh, space and air to breathe and kind of push them back and created liberated zones all over Ireland. There was also a social rebellion, uh, which isn't talked about. Two general strikes, uh, one organised against um, conscription, and other organised to free uh, people who were put in jail, uh, uh, you know, who, who, without charges. Uh, so the labour movement of the working class came into being in that period as well. There was, I mean, the Limerick Soviet is quite well known about, but there was workplace occupations all over Ireland in this period. The agricultural workers seized land um, all over Ireland. So you really have two things coming together, which was the, the war of liberation uh, and the social rebellion, uh, where people sensed that, that there's, a, there's an opportunity now not just to get the Brits out or get the British Empire out, but that we can fundamentally transform social relations in Ireland. And this isn't discussed, and I think we have to see 1916 and the rebellion as a, as a door to open up uh, a discussion about, about those events as well. Um, so, you know, this is... Um, um, so I think the ideas, this brings it back to, to, to the, the, the ideas. Um, so this is where you know, the idea came for doing a, um, uh, an edition, another edition of Connolly's own writings. And I think over the next couple of months we'll, we'll, we will see, there is quite a few books coming out about 1916. There's lots of them in Ireland. Um, all, the, all the national newspapers are carrying articles and uh, magazines and, 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 and uh, different... Um, different things about, about, about the rising. Um, uh, but I think one thing that's very important is to allow Connolly's own voice to speak to people, because I think that there's, in the, in the, in the movement against austerity and the fight for uh, the repeal of the eight in Ireland and so on, uh, there, we need ideas, to, 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 and I think that Connolly's ideas can actually help us figure out how to win the battles uh, of the future. 
So Brendan is the, the, the Connolly himself. Um, as Alan mentioned, there's a lot of myths uh, uh, about, about, uh, about Connolly. Uh, the first one, I think, is that we have to reject. I mean, I'll just throw out what the myths are. One, that, he, that he's a straightforward son of Ireland, that, he was a, you know, that he's a nationalist hero, um, and that, uh, um, you know, that he was born, about, born in Ireland, that all he was really interested in in 1916 was liberating Ireland, that this was only, an Ir only something you could understand in the Irish context. I don't think that that's true at all, and I'll talk a bit about, about why that's the case. Uh, two, that Connolly believed that this was a that he was sacrificing himself in Ireland. I don't think Connolly, in response to Pierce, talked about uh, these ideas of sacrifice being absolutely nonsense. That he, he was never interested in sacrificing himself um, uh, for for Ireland. That the that you know by 1916 and some of the things that didn't go right in terms of the actual rebellion, they had choices to make, uh, but they had planned the rebellion even though the forces that they wanted to put into the field were, weren't going to materialise, I think that they would have been executed for planning an uprising. So you have to say, go ahead with the uprising, see what happens, or face the same consequences anyway, because you would have been charged with treason um, and, uh, uh, during a war. So the British, would, British authorities would likely have executed Conley and many of the other rebels uh, if, the, if the uprising hadn't happened uh, either. So, you know, Connolly's widely celebrated, uh, but he's very little un understood, and I think we have to take the opportunity um, to, to address that. I don't think that the distortion of Connolly is an accident. I think he was probably, from the point of view of the Irish ruling class and the people who came to run the free state, he was the most dangerous of the rebels because he not only represented national liberation, but he talked about uh, 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 you know, turning uh, Ireland upside down in terms of the social order, and that obviously uh, had to be put uh, in a box and had to be suppressed <coughs> and pushed back. Um, so, uh, you know, as Alan talked about, um, uh, a lot of people wouldn't know in Ireland that Connolly was actually born in Scotland. Such as that, that's how successful the kind of myth making about Connolly and the other rebels has been. And I just think that there's a number of things about Connolly that allow us to look at Connolly differently from, I mean, look at him in a global perspective. First of all, uh, we, you know, we see uh, images constantly now of refugees fleeing uh, North Africa and the Middle East. I mean, Connolly's own parents were refugees from the, the Great Hunger in Ireland. That's how they ended up in Edinburgh. Uh, they couldn't afford to travel to the United States. They couldn't afford to, arrive, to get to Australia. It was much more, uh, uh, it was less expensive to arrive, to arrive here. Uh, and they faced all the same problems that refugees are facing today. Um, Connolly himself, uh, well, he, he never really escaped poverty his whole life. Even when he became a much better known organizer and activist, he was always living on, on the edge of poverty. Um, and a number of times, uh, you, know, you could describe Connolly as an economic migrant. In a lot of ways, his reasons for ending up in Ireland were he was an economic migrant in Ireland. I mean, he could have ended up in South America on a farm. Um, and instead, he got encouraged by John Leslie that, that when that ad was put in Justice newspaper and ends up, it ends up in Dublin. Uh, in 1903, again, even though there was a lot of problems uh, and difficulties with the Irish Socialist Republican Party, um, it's really poverty that forces Connolly to move to the United States. And he lives as an immigrant for, there for seven years. And, and, and you know, some of his writings actually reflect and talk about the experience of being an immigrant in the United States and being one of millions of Irish people who are forced to make that journey or millions of other um, uh, people from across Europe who were arriving uh, on Ellis Island. Um, uh, uh, so, so I think that's important in terms of thinking about Connolly today in the midst of, of some of the, the, the great struggles that we're seeing. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't know either that Connolly is an army veteran and served in the British Army, uh, you know, the Oppressor's Army in Ireland for seven years and was actually part of, uh, it's likely that meant that he was on duty during the Queen's Jubilee um, when there would have been attempts at protests. It means that he was likely sent out when there was sectarian rioting in Belfast in 1886 uh, and put down the rioting. So Connolly's first experience of Ireland was in the, the uh, you know the uniform of the British Army, um, and so he has first-hand experience of that. So if you just 
Add that up, what does that mean? Uh, this begins to break up the myth of Conley, of the you know, Irish only uh, uh, hero. Uh, Conley was a, uh, an economic migrant, a former British Army uh, private, who ends up leading the Irish Revolution. And I just think that that is a way for people to, to think about Conley in a different, a different kind of way, and I think that that's uh, important. Because I would like to see more Army veterans, uh, whether it's British Army veterans, American Army veterans, becoming leaders of revolutionary movements. Uh, I would like to see more refugees in Ireland and in Scotland becoming leaders of the trade union movement, becoming leaders um, of, uh, of revolutionary movements. So think in that way, if we think about Connolly, we can have a vision of what our movements and struggles uh, can, actually, uh, can actually look like. Um, so, uh, you know, a big part of the distortion about Connolly is that, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of them, he became... He, he became a supporter of Germany, uh, that he was a German militarist by 1916. I, I think it's far more complicated. Conley uh, was opportunistic in a sense, in a strategic sense, meaning, yes, they wanted German guns. The, the Unionists had gotten German guns, and they needed guns if they were going to organize an uprising. That's where the guns were coming from. Um, but if, you, if, if, Pierce, if, the, if the things that Pierce said were correct, uh, it tells you about the complexity of Conley's views. He says, Conley says in public um, that we should work with the Germans in private. He says uh, they're just as bad as the British and we should carry out the uprising by ourselves. And I think that that gets to the truth, really, of what Conley thought about. We're told that he was an Orthodox Catholic. Um, when he's talking to his closest collaborators, uh, it, 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 he, uh, when he's accused in the United States of being a Jesuit spy inside the labor movement, he says, look, I have, I have basically no faith I haven't had any for a long, long time. I've adopted this pose in order to be able to more effectively challenge the free thinkers. Um, and I think that that's, that's Conley. He was, trying to, he, he was always trying to figure out uh, how to strategically win political battles. Um, and so there's many of these type of uh, uh, distortions that exist with him. And then, uh, and then I think that the, uh, in a lot of ways the most important one is that he abandoned his socialism in 1916 and became uh, an Irish Republican or an, or an Irish nationalist. And I think we have to reject the idea that Conley somehow after spending almost all his adult life uh, in 1916 uh, gave, gave up that great struggle. I think as we'll see, um, he remained very faithful to that struggle and his whole strategy around 1916 was about advancing uh, working class revolution across, across Europe. Um, uh, and as people here will know uh, from Alan's talk, I mean, when Conley joined the socialist movement, uh, he, he studied Marxism. It wasn't just some sort of add-on for Conley. Like, he went to study groups and read Marx and got taught by other uh, Scottish Marxists and was involved in all sorts of meetings with the best of the European and international socialist movement coming through Scotland to give talks and, and part, of those, uh, part of those debates. Um, and uh, I, I think in Scotland, Conley learned how to, uh, he, he began to learn the skills of an organiser in terms of translating Marxism and popularising it for broader working class audiences. The other thing that he did as well, I think he, I think he became a Marxist first, and then, uh, you know, with working with people like John Leslie, he began to think about how to apply uh, Marxist ideas to Irish politics. Which, which had a big impact then uh, on, his, on his time in, in, when, he, when he actually ended up in Ireland. Uh, one thing from his Scottish experience that I think is very, very, uh, it's, a, it's a great quote, but I think as socialists get closer now to getting elected, as we've seen in Europe and elsewhere in Ireland, um, that what Conley talked about, he says, uh, you know, that, that a socialist, when they're elected to any public body at present, is only valuable in, that they're, in as far as they become a uh, disturber of the political peace. And I think that that idea of Conley, that captures, I think, what Conley was all about. It was about, uh, you know, Conley wasn't a reformer. He, he, you know, we can see through his writings, he believed that revolution was necessary. Um, but I think that that's an idea of, if you get in the elected office, what is your role? Uh, it, 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 you know, it, I think it's about how do you become a disturber of normality if you're in Stormont, if you're in the Assembly, or if you're here, uh, 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 and, and how do you inspire people and encourage people to organize struggles uh, that go beyond what is, what is acceptable uh, and what the other parties might uh, uh, accept. Uh, Conley moves to, to Dublin in 1896, um, 
and with a small group of people from the Dublin <coughs> Socialist Club, forms the Irish Socialist Republican Party. And I think that I think that this is where we begin to see some of Conley's genius, if you want to call it that, because I think that what he does is that the, the two wings of the Irish struggle, the Irish National Liberation struggle, or the independence movement and the socialist movement, up until that point, were fairly distinct and different. And Conley, uh, within a couple of months, the new organisation put out a, a manifesto and basically said uh, the, 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 we, we, uh, the, the, the national and the economic struggle of the Irish people have to go in the same direction. Uh, so he basically tied from then on the, the struggle for independence against British rule with socialism. And he said that, gen, that direction is towards the establishment of an Irish socialist republic uh, where we would control the means of production, the land of Ireland, uh, that would be put under the control of, of uh, Irish people. And that was quite pioneering uh, in a lot of ways. So Engels, eight years before Connolly had arrived in, in, uh, in Dublin, he was asked by it was a New York newspaper, what are the prospects for a socialist movement in Ireland? And Engels said, there's not much likelihood of a pure socialist movement anytime soon in Ireland. And, and obviously, understandably, the lack of economic development in Ireland, uh, the lack of a, a, you know, an industrial proletariat, all pointed in that direction. So Connolly gave an answer to this, which was that we might have a small working class, um, but there is a we are a, a colonised nation, and the, the, the working class movement can actually lead the, a general movement for uh, uh, you know liberation from British Empire that can become a struggle then for for workers' power. I think that that was that. So this was Connolly's version, I believe, of a kind of permanent revolution, even though he didn't, he didn't talk about it in that way, but, it, but there was no stagism of, first of all, we struggle for um, you know, an independent Ireland, and then we wait and wait and wait, and then at some point down the line, we will, we will try our hand at uh, fighting for some form, of, uh, some form of socialism. There was a real dynamism 